uh, steering committee as well, so he, he needed to come here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, Miro. Thanks on the presentation. <laughs> Moving on to our second keynote presentation. Uh, this is uh, Daniel Robles. Daniel has a uh, professional engineering uh, certification in, in the United States, and he has an MBA, uh, Master of Business Administration. He is the founder and executive director of the Integrated Engineering Blockchain Consortium, IEBC. IEBC is a worldwide network of engineering professionals building blockchain <coughs> applications to the engineering profession. IEBC has authored seminal papers on this topic for the National Society of Professional Engineers, National Association of Insurance Commissioners, and recently won the ASCE International Grand Challenge Innovation Award in New Technology Category. IEBC has cited widely across international engineering publications, white papers, academic research. Uh, Mr. Robles' career spans over 30 years across diverse industries, including aerospace, construction, international education, for companies such as Boeing, Hughes, Northrop, and he even was in Hollywood uh, developing mechanical special effects. Uh, I'd like to introduce Daniel Robles. He's always been the type of person who brings people up with him. So he always carries a long project. And I happen to have been a very lucky uh, member of, of, of his group at the Boeing Company. So um, it, it's just great to be back here and working in this, with this group and visiting you all. One of the reasons why we're cited so much is because we're the only ones doing it. It's not that we're really up in that, uh, really knocking this stuff out. There's so few engineers in this domain. It's all dominated by financial companies and by insurance companies, and I'll show you why. But the conclusion we'll get to is that blockchain will not and cannot reach its full potential until the engineers get involved. And there's a very interesting reason for this. So this, um, this discussion is, do I have an agenda here? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell some stories. Because that's the best way to, it's such a broad topic, it goes in so many different directions. It's a, it's a spider web, there's hype, there's truth, there's, there's, there's manipulation of truth, there's all kinds of stuff out there. There's a lot of money involved. When you get money involved, that tends to, to speed things out of control. Um, so we're going to tell some stories, and then we're going to talk about a brief history of blockchain. I'm not going to get into the details. The mathematics are involved, uh, but we're not going to get into that. Fun facts. We're going to talk a little bit about the you can't have the logic and why it works. And I promise this out why we shouldn't be worried. Because we shouldn't be worried at all. Um, why we should be excited is that there is, there is a big opportunity, but it's not what you expect. And then finally, what can we all do about it? Here? Okay. So let me stick by the mic so I can't run around. That's probably good. Okay, as you probably predicted, it all starts with beer. Um, this is the Engineering Student Council of University of Haven in 1985. What happened was that I was president of the ASME, and we went to the student government and said, hey, we want to take some of these trips to these factories, and we give us some money, we need to pay for, you know, for these trips. It's okay, here's 25 bucks. 25 bucks, are you kidding me? Yeah, for the whole year. No, wait a minute, you just gave that fraternity 500 bucks to throw a beer party, and you're giving us $25 for our entire program. So I went, so they said, yeah, because that's what we always do. So I went back to the other engineering groups, the ASCE, the IEEE, the software engineers, and I said, hey guys, look, this is, this is nuts. Let's get together. And overnight, we became the largest organization on campus. We were also associated with a lot of the funders of the university. So we had a meeting with the provost, and before you know it, we had plenty of money for beer. 
and our trips, by the way. So the, the first lesson you learn is that you know together collaboration, multidisciplinary collaboration, is so important. And this is all in a, in a domain of business where at the time it was hyper competitiveness. There was Michael Porter out there publishing in Five Forces of. Pro of ultra competitiveness and, and here we are saying well no wait a minute you collaborate and you form a network and this is more efficient it's not better or worse it's more efficient and engineers we like efficiency um, again so the integrated engineering blockchain consortium I credit it to many different teams that I've been working with uh, it's not me it's other people that have contributed so much to this that we've arrived at this position today um, one of our uh, like Rodney said, I did, I did work in Hollywood. And let me just mention something about Hollywood, which is really, really interesting. Do you know those credits at the end of the movie that kind of go by way too fast, frankly, to read? And you're wondering, what are those there for? This is, I can't read it, it's going by too fast. Well, that isn't for your benefit. Those credits are not for your benefit. Those credits are for the benefit of Hollywood. And what happens with those credits is what you're doing mechanically is every 24 frames per second, you're imprinting that person's name on a different section of that, of that frame every 24 seconds as it scrolls by. You kind of see how that works. And, and then you're making it indelible and it cannot be changed. So if I want to rely on my resume, for example, I would have to cheat that scrolling thing and I would have to somehow change the name on all 50 or 200 frames I show up in. Not only that, they distributed that, that, that video all across the world. So I would have to go out to every single DVD and I would have to get in there and manipulate every single one of them in order for me to execute that corruption. Okay, so you can see how it kind of serves the purpose of a blockchain because it's the cost of corrupting it far exceeds the value that you that you, you gain from it. So in, in this manner, you get a lot of a different dynamic. Working in Hollywood is different because everybody's so committed to getting that project done because they need to get that movie. Has to be a blockbuster hit because their next job is dependent on it. Okay, and, 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 you, and the whole thing about Hollywood is you gotta be on those credits or you have to know somebody who's on those credits because if they validate you, that, that's their whole knowledge management system. And it, it's, it's different, it's not better or worse, but it operates in a very interesting way. So that's something I want to bring up. Um, and then, after that, I, I worked on shuttle and so forth, but after that, um, we went to, I went to NAFTA, I got involved with the NAFTA mutual recognition document. This was just a great trade agreement, where they tried to get um, engineering services to trade like, um, like, you know, any kind of service, like private services across the border between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And this was back in 1995. And so I, I thought, well, gosh, I was in between jobs. I think I'll go down there and figure out what this is all about, and maybe there'll be some opportunities. And I took a job at a small um, engineering school, very progressive, fine, fine engineering school. And when you first go into Mexico, and this is back 25 years, the first impression you get is, my gosh, the infrastructure is terrible. And then the second thing you think is, boy, those engineers must be hard. And you just start sulking. Oh, my goodness, what are we getting ourselves into? But then I was there. And I worked with the students, and I noticed that they were exceptionally smart. I mean, and creative. And the disconnect was I couldn't handle it. I'm like, wait a minute, that infrastructure, awesome engineers, where's the problem? So what I did was I took these engineers and I sent them to the American U.S. Board exams, the EIT, and they passed at an extraordinary level. And by the time we, then we started taking a random sample of all the engineers, not just from this hot, this very good university, but from all the engineers in the community, and they still maintain a, a pass ratio consistent or, or, or similar to the Americans with a the language disparity. But there, there was nothing wrong with the engineers at all. What it turned out was that there's this um, really interesting dynamic. It's, it's a virtuous circle between finance, insurance, and engineering. Okay, the, a, a bank will not finance a project unless it's insured. An insurance company will not insure a project unless it's properly engineered. And you can't do proper engineering unless there's financing to cover the soft costs. Okay, so it's this virtuous circle. It's like a three-legged stool. You knock out one of those legs and the whole thing comes down. So when you look at a country like Mexico, the problem is not the engineers, the problem was the immature financial institutions. 
Okay, so this is a very interesting thing that we, uh, that we learned. So what happened was we measured the engineers differently. That's all we did. And all the engineers from our program went on to get jobs with, with the multinational corporations. In fact, one of those engineers later at Boeing became my manager. So you know, you know you're doing something right when, when, when that happens. So that's, that was uh, something that we learned along the way. I'm sorry, I'm going to stay here. Yes, I'm going to stay here. OK, the next. Um, so then we looked at, I went to Boeing, okay, and Boeing, I got involved with these, I had my regular job, but then I got involved with the technical fellowship, and they were trying to solve these problems of, like, the, the employment gap. There was a lot of very young engineers, there were a lot of very senior engineers, and there was nothing in the middle. So they're trying to get, how do you get these folks to talk to those folks and try to get them to educate each other, when the older engineers were trying to protect their jobs or hoarding information. The younger engineers, they just wanted to go do stuff. So how do you bring these two bodies together? So what we did was we ended up creating a, in the internship program, we, we created this, this mutual learning scenario so that an older engineer could learn new technology from a younger engineer, like how to start a website, and how to, you know, what's the social media thing all about. And then we bring these two groups together and then they start sharing. They have a mutual exchange between them. And some of the, uh, some of the communications were just simply profound. You know, some of the older engineers, they had kids who were you know, making proper choices and they would ask the younger engineers what to do about it. So it's it far greater, far deeper than just engineering. And then you bring this to management at Boeing and they say, okay, what's the ROI? Well, what ROI is this beautiful stuff? People are communicating, they're, they're getting to know each other, transfer of information. No, I need to see ROI. Measure it. Well, how can I measure it? You know, so that was, a, that was a big problem. How do you measure something like that? And how do you put it into a construct that can be digested by uh, the financial side of things? So that was interesting. That's when we met, um, uh, it was Jim Robles was there too, right? Right, Rodney? And he was doing work with uh, Second Life, was that virtual, virtual, um, uh, game that he was trying to uh, uh, trying to model and simulate using these social programs. And it was a social problem we are trying to get at. Um, then later on I left and I, I started in Genesis Project where I started publishing a lot of ideas like this. And then I started a company called Social Flights with some other partners. And that was a ride sharing service for jets. So a lot of private jets are flying around half empty as they deliver their, uh, their cargo to whatever location or their, or their executive. And they're flying back empty. And we're saying, hey, maybe we can sell those seats. But there's so many variables involved, um, like you know, the crew times, how much they can fly, the FAA regulations, uh, air, air traffic control, um, availability, short-term availability, short-term cancellations, all these things. So if you try to build a business model on these discrete events, trying to script out something like that, it just didn't work. Okay? You could not close that business plan. However, if you looked at it in terms of probabilities, so what's the probability that I can find somebody at this location who wants to go to that location within a certain period of time? Then you start seeing some sense in the numbers. You start to see, wait a minute, now we can start doing this. Now we can actually impact the probability that something can, do, can happen. So now the, the people running the company could know what to do next to impact these probabilities. And then it all comes out in the wash later as a viable business plan. Okay, so we are acquired by, by, by another company, but um, we learned a whole lot doing that. My goodness. Um, finally, then we went to, uh, then I started a company called Co-Engineers, uh, LLC, PLLC. Now that was my own personal uh, engineering consulting firm, and we were working in the construction industry. And in the construction industry, we had a very similar problem because what's happening on a construction site is so complex. You know, the, the wallboard guy doesn't show up, and then the plumbers get stuck in traffic, and then you have to redo the schedule. So you can never really script a program. And if you did script a program, it would just fall apart by the end of the day. However, you could start looking at it again in terms of probabilities. Or you could start looking at the points where risk is transferred from one entity to another entity. And those became your hard points. So you start managing those hard points. You start managing risk. You're not managing ROI anymore. You're, you're looking at risk. And, and you're managing it uh, with some proper risk uh, equations, with some proper mathematics and actuarial uh, math. And quantitative analysis can now be applied as long as you have um, these points that you can measure and isolate, and you have a time function. Okay, you have a clock, it's going clock, clock, and everybody's synchronized to this clock, you can get the job done that way. So we started publishing on this stuff, and one thing we had co-engineers, we found out, this is just about the time when, when blockchain started getting famous. 
So we built this little cryptocurrency. We went, you can make a cryptocurrency, you know, any one of you could have one in 20 minutes. And we built a cryptocurrency called the Quant. It was on the BitShares blockchain. And we were, we were, the problem we had was engineers were hiring each other. So we were independent engineers. So I would hire Rodney, you know, this is literally, but I would hire Rodney, he would hire me. And then at the end of the month, we would we have to sell. So you need sort of this merchant currency, something to, to keep track of, of who did what for whom. And then at the end of the month or end of the quarter, you, you, you'd sell. So we used this electronic token called a quant. And we started trading these among all the engineers and they'd all settle out and it was all electronic spreadsheet, it was all public so everybody could see it. It was on a blockchain, wow, this is pretty slick. And what ended up happening was these engineers started to trade among themselves and say, look, you never had that, that situation where you go, somebody says to you, hey, I want to pick your brain, uh, let me buy you a cup of coffee. And you're saying, okay, well, wait a minute, a cup of coffee is $2 and my brain's worth like a hundred bucks an hour, and no way. You know, but, but, so you, but you do it anyway because you like the person. But when you exchange a token between somebody, this digital token, hey, I'll give you a hundred quant if you show me how you, how you analyze that piping material. Show me where those failures are gonna show up in five years on that, on that polypropylene pipe. Uh, you know, where do you get this information? There's no books published on it. You have to find the person who has it and get them to sit down and give up their secrets. So you give them the plot. And we found out that um, engineers are willing to spend five or six times more time with you if you're exchanging this little currency that has absolutely no value whatsoever. Then, as a matter of fact, the currency has less value than a cup of coffee. But they were spending more time with you with this currency and they were with a cup of coffee. So what's going on here? Well, the only thing we can say is we can't tell you what the value of that quant is. Only thing we could say is that quant is non-zero. The value is non-zero. What was happening is when I give you, uh, uh, when I ask for your time, you now have a claim on my time because you hold these tokens. And we've got this mutual reciprocity between us. So now it's you're putting my knowledge in the bank, essentially, with this exchange system. Okay, this is really, really interesting. This is the, this is the anthropology of, of, of cryptocurrencies, and, and we're just figuring this out. This is, so this is how we're, we're actually starting to run a company this way. And you know, we're not involved, we're not trading Bitcoin, we're not involved in any of that. We're just kind of using these tools that are showing up for us. Uh, so we started publishing this information. We published the NSP white paper, their position paper, and we're, we're trying to say that, look, these cryptocurrencies, the way they're built, is very, very similar to the engineering process itself, to the, to the PE process, when you have to have these validations, you have to take these exams, you have to put the, have a mutable record, you have to have a stamp, which it, it puts finality on a drawing, and, and, and all these things, you know, so we're saying, well, this is, there's this major comparison here. Uh, so we published that white paper, and then for the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, we're telling him, look, you know, if you, if you look at the world in terms of risk, you know, now the, the engineers can be that third financial instrument if you were to measure us differently. Okay, instead of measuring us in terms of the stuff that we can produce, measure us in terms of the risk we can remove. Okay, just two different ways of measuring the same thing. Okay, so this is what that paper was all about. And, and it sort of makes sense, because you know, if you have a, a, fire, a fireman, the value of a fireman, a firefighter, is, is a million bucks an hour when there's a fire because they're saving all this property. And other than that, they're, they're, just, they're not doing much. They're doing important stuff, but it's not a million bucks an hour. Um, but the fire protection engineer could design a building which will never burn. But if the building never burns, you've got no way to measure the value of that engineer. Right? If the building is burning, you can measure the value of the fireman, but you can't measure the value of the engineer. Okay, so these are, these are kind of interesting stuff, things to, to talk about, uh, especially in our profession, because we are um, the profession which does uh, eliminate risk or remove risk. So then we, we, we spoke more about how quant worked at, at the uh, ASCE um, um, challenge winner and then the Integrated Engineering Blockchain Consortium we, we built out of the FinTech Task Force and the NSPE. So now we've got hundreds of members and what we are doing is we are actually building a blockchain by engineers for engineers, okay, and this now we just got some funding from Switzerland. We got partners called Blockhouse out of Switzerland. So this is just starting to take off, and it's really, really exciting. And um, and, and this is what I what I'm doing now. In 2018, um, we, we we're going to be actually releasing our blockchain in a couple of of, of weeks. So you're probably asking yourself, what in the world is the blockchain? Um, well. 
the origins are not new. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't invented in 2009 with Satoshi Nakamoto. You've heard you've heard the stories. It's not new. Um, World War II cryptography, multi-key signatures is very typical. You, you have a message, you lock it with one key, and you lock it with the other key, you toss the other key to the other person, they open it with that key, and then their private key is associated with your key mathematically, and that's how you secure packages. So it's not, it's nothing new. And then airplanes and spacecraft have been using um, voting computers. This is Airbus, and actually the space shuttle started with it, and Airbus, they use these voting computers. And what the computers, they have duplicate sensors out there, and they all read the different sensors, and then in order, to, then you, you read, you know, they evolve vote, which is the actual truth. Um, and then you still can't secure the, the node, you still can't, the computer could be hacked, you, you would never know that. So they add a second step, it's voting on the vote. So now the end of computers have to vote that their vote was the vote that they voted, okay? And if that vote is not unanimous, then you notify the pilot, Something, something's gone wrong. If it is unanimous, very high probability everything's going fine, even if they're disagreeing. So this is stuff that the engineers have been doing for, for decades. Uh, blockchain, there's something called the Byzantine proof that was, that was invented by some consultants in the late 80s, but you know, engineers have been doing it much longer than that. Then there's hashing functions. It's a traditional idea of, of cryptography. They take a, 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 a message and they jumble it all up, and, and then you go to the other side and you have an algorithm which unjumbles it. So, so these are all components. Um, but what came later was, um, was blockchain is the thing that, that came in 2009, which kind of combined all these technologies. So you know you can get out to Google, and in uh, a few minutes, uh, you can have these same definitions that I have. Um, Wikipedia, a blockchain is a decentralized, distributed, and public digital ledger that is used to record transactions across many computers so that that record cannot be altered without the alteration of all the subsequent blocks and the collusion of the network. My gosh, that sounds, all those words fit together, but what does it really mean? Well, part of it means, like the thing in Hollywood, remember, you couldn't, you know, that second part where you, you were, the record cannot be altered retroactively without the alteration of all subsequent frames and the collusion of the network that's corrupting all the DVDs that have been distributed. Okay, so that's what blockchain does. That's very interesting. And then um, the dictionary.com has a, it's, a, it's a digital ledger which in, in which transactions made in Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency are recorded chronologically and publicly. Wow, that sounds like what we were doing with co-engineers. We were recording these these, uh, these digital transactions. Um, and my definition, which I like the best, is blockchain is a clumsy little dance that a computer needs to do in order to simulate something that humans have been doing for centuries. Okay, so if, if you, these words make sense, they're interesting, but if you look at the underlying words, if you look at it, you're just an engineer, you don't know anything, you look at decentralized distributed, you're thinking, wow, that looks like a, a random sample, this distributed amount of data, and if I take a random sample from this, I can do some interesting analysis. That's what it is. Okay, if you look at recording transactions or record chronologically, that looks like a data log, right? You know, the paper goes by, the data log is punching little, you know, you know, that's exactly what that is. Um, so, so you can simulate, to simulate this human condition. So you start asking yourself, I don't think it was intentional, but those tools are baked into blockchain. Tools that we use every day, tools that we need for our, our built. So you have to start wondering, maybe there's a higher meaning, maybe there's something else we can do, not just Bitcoin. And that's where we're concentrating on. Um, now, you're probably wondering why I have that guy walking down the stairs like that. Um, that's a, a computer, that's a robot walking down the stairs, and you all think that's just amazing. It's, it's, it's so cool, it, it, and you can sort of extrapolate on that some future where robots are bringing breakfast in bed or, or, or you're thinking, you're anthropomorphizing your motions on this technology, and, and that's where all the hype comes from. It really is, because people are seeing this technology and they're extrapolating into this other universe and you get a lot of noise. So the signal-to-noise ratio is really poor out there right now. So a lot of people are confused, they don't know what's right, what's wrong. But we try to stick just to the engineering facts. Um, that robot is not the best way to bring something up a flat of stairs. An elevator does the same job. Okay, so 
you know, it's also to say that you don't need blockchain in a lot of situations where you may think you need blockchain. However, you, using blockchain where you do need it can be enormously effective. Okay, but that's not the easiest way to solve that problem. But it is the one that everybody gets excited about. Everybody puts their money down on. Nobody's buying an elevator. It does the same thing. So that's kind of kind of trying to put the, the rationality or put the um, you know put some some sense to all this. So what problem does blockchain solve? It's a handshake. That's all it is. It's uh, if you if you think back to early. I don't know, maybe 1400 market, okay, there's a central market, people don't really know each other, they come from miles around to trade their chickens and their corn and so forth, and you want to, um, you know, trade your chicken with somebody, you want some corn, you go up to the guy, you never met him, and you guys hold hands. You put the chicken on the table, he puts the corn on the table, you inspect the corn, he inspects the chicken, you guys think it's a good deal, you grab the corn, he grabs the chicken, you release hands. And the reason is, you know what, there's always some point when somebody can grab the chicken and the corn and run away. Okay? So you have these, these make, I mean, actually, I'm not even sure if that's where the handshake came from. I completely made that up. But it works, kind of, for this. But, but that's kind of how it works. So there's this period of time where, where it's like an escrow service or, or, or something like that. So that's the problem that it solves. Except with instead of not using chickens and corn, you're using um, contracts. So the problem now is if, if I issue a contract digitally and I send the contract to you, sir, um, we both now have the same identical contract. And he can change the terms, I can change the terms, and there's no way to determine who's got the valid contract. Okay, there's no way to do that. So this is what's limiting a lot of what's happening in, in, in computers because databases just don't talk to each other. They can't talk to each other. Okay, so you need a different type of database, a fundamentally different type of database. So that idea of contracts, it's also very good for money, because if I train, there's always that double spend problem. Same here, even if there's a microsecond when the accounting system is dead, um, adding it to one account and subtracting it to the other account, if there's even a, a nanosecond in between, somebody's gonna write a bot to grab that money. Okay, so you have to have things working kind of backwards. You, know, you can't go retroactive. So this, this is what a blockchain accomplishes. And here's, here's the little dance that it does to do so. Um, I know it looks really silly, but it is kind of silly. Um, so anyway, you've got this uh, a chain of vaults. Consider a chain of vaults. And there's three rules. The computer makes these three rules. Um, the combination for each locker is stored in the prior locker. That's simple enough. Um, each combination can only be used once. I can accept that. No, no two lockers can be opened at the same time. Yeah, it's pretty easy. These are really easy rules for a computer to make. So what happens is, Assume one door is open. Now I want to open the next door, so I reach in, I grab the combination. I try to open the door, it won't open. Oh, I gotta close this door first. So I close that door, now the combination opens this door. And then people start throwing their, con you know, you can throw your contract or whatever in there, that vault is open. You throw away the key, because you can't use, uh, you can't use anymore, you have to take that key, that key out, and then you have to close that door and open up the next key like this, you kind of do this. And that assures that it only goes in one direction and it assures that no two blocks are open at the same time. So your contract has to be time-stamped at a different time than mine. So that makes yours most valid than mine. So everybody understands this, and everybody, everybody accepts this, and this becomes the consensus. Everybody is in consensus that this is working properly and that that contract comes before my contract, therefore his is valid, it's not mine. Okay, so that's, that's what it does. Um, but you need to somehow get that thing to happen. You know, who's going to be doing these, the combination, who's opening those locks, who's doing that door stuff? You have to have some disinterested party, somebody who, who doesn't have access to the content, or doesn't want access, access to the contents. So they have these things called miners. And instead of using a key to open a locks, lock, they have these mathematical puzzles. So the miners, they get there and they start solving these puzzles, and the faster they can solve, the first one to solve the puzzle is the one who gets to open the door. You open the door and you get some Bitcoin. And you, now you've got these tokens that mean almost nothing. Um, and this continues, so your, your challenge is to earn these tokens. Now, if Bitcoin did not have value, there would be no way to compensate people for performing this task of solving puzzles. They're trivial puzzles. But the fact that the Bitcoin has value is what's keeping this thing alive. And the day that the Bitcoin goes below the cost of producing these blocks, the electricity, is the day that it, it, it 
goes bankrupt. Nobody's going to do it anymore, or they're going to shift to another. So we've never been there. We don't know what that looks like. So that's all stuff that's in the future. But that's, a, just, that's how the coin comes into existence. It's, to, it's a function of mining. Now, fun facts. $100 worth of Bitcoin in 2010 is now worth $14 million today. How did that happen? Bitcoin market cap is $250 billion. The total cryptocurrency market cap is about $500 billion. But only 1,000 people control 40% of Bitcoin. Doesn't sound very decentralized, does it? Well, it's supposed to be very decentralized, but things are happening, things we never expected. FinTech VC, venture capital-backed FinTech um, investment is, is close to $16.6 .6 billion. This is, these are banks. Now, of course, banks are really scared of this stuff because it pretty much wipes out everything they do, all the, all the administration and all the funding and all the fees that they get. You know, you don't need them to pay those fees anymore. Um, so they're trying to incorporate it, trying to adopt it. InsureTech is looking at it a little bit differently because it, it all those it's very very time and per people intensive insurance in and, and that business and they can do that on a blockchain they perceive better. EngTech almost nothing. Engineering nobody is I mean I don't see any uh, I'm the only one talking about that I know of um, in, in the professional engineering domain at, at least. And we've approached many companies and a lot of them are very scared of this thing. Um, if you're a government contractor and you're talking about cryptocurrencies, you don't want to go sideways with the government about money, so it just has bad optics. Or construction is, is kind of rife with, with corruption and any other form of transfer, especially internationally, any other form of transferring money or value, it, it's a bad optics. You know? So for some reason, we're really holding back while everybody else is really moving forward. But at the end of the day, a Bitcoin is a change of state. It's nothing more. It has no value. It's got no intrinsic value. It's an electron. It's a jewel. It, it, that's a problem. That's a persistent problem. Um, and now more fun facts. If you look at, uh, they're calling it money. And if you look at the, but don't worry too much about it just yet. You see Bitcoin is that really small dot at the end. And the total world money is 83 points a trillion dollars. Um, that's out of scale, by the way, because that little dot at the bottom should be about one two thousandth of the big dot. So you see there's a lot, a lot of ways to go before Bitcoin is dominating everything. But on the other hand, you look at the, the, um, the global debt record. Okay, so we owe ourselves five times or three times more money than we have that exists on Earth. So until we have a, a, a free trade agreement with Mars or something, you know, we're, we're stuck, all right? So people are seeing an adjustment is, is going to happen. And if you look at money, it's pretty much a digital token anyway, except it's, it's backed by the institutions of government. And if blockchain is a digital token, and or Bitcoin is a digital token, and money is kind of a digital token, what's the difference between the two? Uh, okay, so if you compare the two, um, assume they're both digital tokens with no intrinsic value, banks are... Uh, the institutions would support banks include the legal system. So if you don't pay your debts, the marshal comes and takes your house. It's supported by the legal system. Um, there's punitive regulations, there's double entry accounting standards and methods, there's courts, jurisdictions, lawyers, and uniform commercial code, all to keep that game fair. This is all very, very expensive stuff. Now, if you can do the same thing with a blockchain, it's very, very efficient. Okay, it's not to say that a blockchain is perfect. There are some severe problems with the blockchain, and I'm going to talk about that next. The problem is this idea of intrinsic value. It has no, at the end of the day, that token is only worth what you can do with Bitcoin that you can't do without Bitcoin. It's a lot, but it's not really intrinsic. Okay, so this is where we come in. So, reconciling the physical world with the virtual world is enormous. This is the thing which is not being paid as much attention to as it really should be. And if you look at things like artificial intelligence, it's, artificial intelligence is a fantastic site, but you will eventually have to calibrate it to some group of experts. Well, where are you going to find those experts? Who are those experts? Who, what's the consensus that that expert is in fact an expert? And now you're going to have them calibrating your virtual reality, um, your, your artificial intelligence, if it's a bad, if you start with bad data, you're going to get bad data. And, and, you know, I think that's how it works. I'm not an expert, but Internet of Things as well. You're going to put a billion sensors in everything, but you're going to have to locate those sensors. You have to manufacture them, you have to maintain them, you have to program them, you have to um, attend to them, you have to replace them, you have to watch out for all these, you know, different, one interfering with another, 
sensors interfering with each other, the internet goes down. I mean, there, there's, there's, you can't go very far before you're running into an engineer, okay, to fix this stuff. Smart contracts, well, smart contracts about what? I mean, I could take a, a, a smart contract, a contract put on a ladder, and it's not going to change the light bulb. So the contract itself is not intrinsic, but the person is. So we cannot escape that idea of personhood. And I think some of these questions are, we're, we're asking about security and person, and, and, and how do you get, get the talent you need? How do you validate talent and so forth? Um, another big one is collateralization. Um, uh, when a bank makes a security, when they build a security, um, it has to be backed by some sort of collateral. Otherwise, the security just ceases to exist. And this is what happened in the, in the 2008 financial crisis. I mean, when, when the vast set was somehow divorced from the security that, 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 was, uh, that was unwritten by it, then you, could know, you, couldn't, you couldn't value the asset anymore. You had to mark to market. And market was failing. So it turned into this, this huge correction. It was only because um, you had somehow divorced the security from the physical world. Okay, so the big need in the future is it's validating the physical state of the world. And that data is what's going to go into these new electronic contracts. Um, and that's where the intrinsic value is going to be coming from. It has to come from humans, somewhere, somehow. And engineers are the ones who are the most qualified to assess physical state. Because the laws of physical state do not change anywhere on the planet. Okay, it is what it is. Gravity and mass do what they do, and there's no debate. There's huge consensus on this. So it's a very, very powerful situation that we find ourselves in, and it's one that we should really consider taking full advantage of. Now you look at the digital twin idea. Um, you look at, you know, all these components, operational history, well that's got to be gathered by an engineer. It's got to be um, put on a chronology, you know, operation history as a time function. You have to, you have to Register this, stuff, register this stuff on some sort of database somewhere. Um, aggregate data, the real-time operational data. Uh, if you had one single database that was secure, and that you could just sort of throw your data up on like a dart, and it's like a moving background, and then you can analyze it later, that's what blockchain provides us. Right now in manufacturing, you have a part going down the assembly line, there's a stack of paper that's associated with that part, and the cost of the paper is often more than the cost of the part. Because you're, you're, you're not, you don't have that, and then the databases don't, don't talk to each other. So I have to go back. I right. uh, just step on this. Excuse me. Oh, digital twin. There we are. I gotta put this thing down when I'm not using it. So, how did the things get there in the first place? So, Internet of Things, question for you. How did the thing get there in the first place? Well, it's engineers. Um, can there be artificial intelligence without actual intelligence? I don't think so. What makes smart contracts smart? Okay, so these, these are the, like the fire, like the fire protection engineer, it's unmeasured, you're invisible. This is all invisible value. And what we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna measure that value into existence, okay? So the digital twin, and I, just, I just went over that. So this is what we're, we're building. It's called Co-Engineers. It's a blockchain by engineers for engineers. And it's, um, we see a future of engineering where we are, um, how would you say, we're competing for commodity pricing. Because our value is wrapped up in the value of the product that we make. It's hard to discern how to separate that. Meanwhile, you've got these networks like Google and Uber and, and, and uh, Facebook and, and Twitter. They're decentralized platforms. Okay, what they do is they aggregate data. That's all they do. And they don't actually create anything, but they're able to extract all that data from it. Well, the opportunity that we have is to become a platform as an engineering profession, or we remain as a commodity. And let me show you how that works. There was a guy named Robert Solo who won the Nobel, Laureate, uh, Nobel Prize for his research in, in, in estimating the contribution that technological change has on economic growth. And he found that 80% of economic growth was attributable to technological change. That's what engineers do. The problem is that it was incorrectly allocated to land, labor, and capital. That's the, the 18th century traditional economic theory that we all learned. 
So all this value that engineers create and produce is being allocated to things that don't produce that same quantity or that same percentage. I don't want to watch my words here, but we're getting ripped off. Okay. <laughs> However, um, the problem is that innovation can't be measured directly. That fire protection engineer, you can't measure that person directly. However, if you measure them in terms of risk, you've got a whole different game. Okay, so now you go back to that thing that we learned in Mexico where the bank will not lend money unless the asset's insured. The insurance company will not insure assets until it's properly engineered, and the properly engineering must be financed to cover soft costs. If you take and create a financial instrument out of the engineering profession, which is measured by the amount of risk that we remove from a system, like the airplanes, you know, when you get an engineer involved in an airplane, it tends to stay up longer. Or the you know, fire protection, or the roads, the bridges, the highways, the, the sensor, the building, the elevator, all that stuff, we're constantly removing risk from the system. Now, one of the companies we're working with is Jacobs Engineering, which is one of the world's largest engineering companies, and their idea is obsolescence insurance. If we could get an entire database and all the engineers contribute all the, all the information about buildings that are out there, when the pump was replaced, when the piping was put in, when the elevator was inspected, it all goes into one database. We can now write an insurance product so that the owner can buy the insurance product and always have their building maintained. You can't do that now. Right now, there's these peaks and valleys where, where the owner you know, has a breakdown and they have to call the crews in and it costs really a lot of money to fix the plumbing and, and the pump. Rate. So it's just a disaster out there. And, but we can do like what the medical insurance does. The CDC is a government agency which publishes all this data and the insurance companies just take the data and they start writing policies. They know the mortality rate of smokers, they know the mortality rate of living in smog congested areas and so forth. They get, so it's almost trivial once you have the data, this large centralized database. So this is what we're trying to build, something that engineers can all contribute to in order to uh, in order to provide this data, which can now be, we can now apply big data to it. So Jacob thinks that the trillions of dollars a year from a $7 trillion industry can be released to the economy if we were to develop uh, this sort of application. And this is, they're, they're one of our strongest proponents in an otherwise pretty sparse field. So risk is really easy to, to do. I mean, you have to be able to identify the risk exposure, right? Simple and easy. You need to determine the probability that that peril will manifest. It has to be a statistical probability. It has to be numerical. And that's what we did with social flights. Remember, we started looking at the world in terms of like probabilities instead of discrete events. Okay, so this is something that we can do. Um, we have to be able to assess the consequences should they manifest. So if there is a hurricane, we have to understand, okay, what are the consequences? What's going to break down? What, what, are the, what's, what infrastructure is going to be damaged? And um, so I believe we're, we're getting a little bit long, right? A little bit long. Okay. So I'm just going to jump to the end. What we're doing is we're creating this. Um, uh, uh, it's a blockchain application where, in order to, um, engineers would put data on this database and they would receive a token called uh, M max, and then we receive another token called uh, uh, gravity. So what will happen is you put, we make a claim, and another engineer has to validate your claim, and together that becomes an asset. And that goes to the centralized database. And now you have this token, the person validating you has this other token. The M token can be sold in a market. So if you're an insurance company and you want and you see a heavy storm season coming, then you would want to purchase these tokens so that you'll have access to the database before and after that event. Okay, so that's what gives the value, the, the token value. Okay, so now you're giving the engineers incentive to put this data on the database, or companies with legacy data can now put it on this database and get residuals. So in essence, you're, you're paying royalties for engineering work, which has never been done before. Right now, you're paying, you're paying time rental. Um, and then what happens is that the, um, the IBOC will distribute this, this will be the container of all this information, and, um, and it would sell, they would sell that, that information back. It would be anonymized, it would be cleansed and anonymized, sell that back to the market, and they would buy more tokens. So it creates a cycle. At some point, we retire, when, when, the, quant, when the money enters the IBOC, the mass enters the IBOC, we retire. So that it's, if, if there's too much demand, then it brings more engineers in, which lowers the price. If the price is low, then people buy more data, it goes up. So it's a stable token. It's not designed for this astronomical speculation. Um, so that's what we're doing, that's what we're launching. 
And tomorrow, the blockchain represents an enormous opportunity for the engineering profession to measure ourselves differently and appear differently to an economy. And engineering provides, uh, the profession provides an enormous opportunity for blockchain. They don't have this physical um, assessment. They need it desperately. There will not be, um, they won't, won't, won't be successful without it. You can't continuously have um, virtual stuff trading. It doesn't work. Um, the highest and best use for this and associated technologies won't happen until engineers organize themselves, like we did back at Beer Hall, um, organize themselves and work together to, to build it for ourselves. And if we don't do it, somebody's going to do it to us, like a Google or an Amazon. I mean, Amazon's building rockets already. Well, anyway, that's it. We're, we have a lot of people working with us. Um, this is really, really exciting times. We're launching very soon. And um, I'll take any, any questions afterwards. And uh, thank you for, for listening to this. Digital ledger has scale issues. Well, we're we're not using a proof of work. Oh, the, the question you asked is the digital ledger has scaling issues. You know, how big can it get? How fast can it can it get? And uh, how much throughput can he find? Assuming how much throughput, how much data can you put through it? So he, he knows he knows what he's asking. There's these issues. We're we're not using something called a proof of of work, we're using something called a proof of stake, and what that is is a, a it's a different proofing algorithm which doesn't use electricity proof of work. It's a different proofing algorithm which provides a lot of security, um, much cheaper and much more reliably, and it solves the scaling problem. So we're using uh, a different we're using a different um, algorithm than than um, Bitcoin and Ethereum even. They're, they're slowed down, but our our blockchain can can has a can, process 10,000 transactions per second. Um, it, it, we produce a block every three seconds, not like um, Bitcoin every 15 minutes. So it's very fast, very high throughput. Um, and, and we haven't, we're not gonna, re we haven't reached that scale yet. And uh, from what I understand, uh, EOS will be the next generation, which will easily exceed uh, scaling. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, great, thumbs up. More questions? Oh, absolutely. And the reason I told those stories, okay, can we use the engineering body of knowledge for training? Um, well, absolutely. The reason I told those stories is because it's impossible to list all the different things you can do with this. You've got a time function, you've got a random sample of data, and you've got all the engineering knowledge in the world. What can't you do with that? So I can't specify everything you can do with it. Well, we're, we're trying to create a utility. And you know, so it's a plug in the wall, and companies like yours or anybody else, you know, they, they put the toaster in, they figure out what they're gonna use it for. But we're just gonna create and provide that one very simple thing as good as and as fast as we can, and then let the entrepreneurs start building on it. Um, the insurance products, micro insurance, um, instant insurance, temporary insurance, all the things you can do now with, with this that you couldn't do without it, just staggering. So we're we're not gonna try to get to that, we're just gonna try to to work on getting that utility right. Questions? Um, were you ever able to show an ROI for that collaborative environment you, you had at Boeing? You know, because I think that's probably a universal problem for a lot of people in this room, is you know, the bean counters don't value that because you can't sell it. Right, and that's going to be the problem throughout this entire uh, world until, and only until, you measure yourself differently. Okay, so if I was to tell them, okay, you remove 83% of risk to your uh, bottom line, they'd be like, I'm all over it. You know, but if you tell them you're going to earn, you know, $14 more per airplane, you know, shrug their shoulders. So, but it's probably the same thing. You know, I mean, it's weird that way. But you, you have to, in order to match the ROI, you have to, 
You have to measure yourself differently. That's all there is to it. Like, the engine, like, the, like that one engineer from, from Mexico who became my boss at Boeing. How that happened? We just measured them differently. They're the same engineer, same people, same border. But we measure them differently and everything changes. And that's what I'm trying to get to is this point where, hey, hey let's stop playing this, this, this race to the bottom thing, you know, with this global sourcing and, and all this stuff. I mean, it's killing us. We're all fighting with each other for jobs. That's not fun. You know, we have to collaborate, and if we do that, we, we measure ourselves differently. Now we become a source of funds. We don't, are not a sink of funds. You see what I mean? So everything changes, I hope. And this is why we're trying to you know, get everybody excited. More questions? Just one quick one. Uh, very interesting, Dan. Could, so you're, you're really talking about capturing knowledge, right? Their intellectual knowledge in, in your tokens, for lack of a better word. Articulating it, yes. Yeah. Uh, so can, have, you, have you talked with people about so the issue of IP protection? And if I'm sharing something, and how, who can I share that with? And is it limited in terms of the people that I'm going to do with the transaction? <laughs> Well, it goes back to, to the transaction record. So if you put a lot of information on there, your transaction record is pretty long. So if you want to gain access to a nuclear power plant, you could use your transaction record as a key to open that door. And that's been validated on a blockchain. And if you've got the proper education experience and validations from everybody along the line, and it's obvious you can't corrupt that blockchain, that door will open. If you don't have that key, if your transaction record does not match the door you're trying to go through, it won't open. Okay, so you've got, uh, you've got these, these built-in mechanisms for encrypting who you are. So now you've got, you can manage the identity. So the IP situation is different because, you know, if you want to preserve your IP, you have to go get a patent. And I got a patent once I tried, it cost like 40 grand, I didn't, I abandoned it. I don't have money time for that. And then, or the money for that, or, or the patent's dead in three weeks, it's static, it doesn't move, it's expensive. That system is not, now the secret sauce. What combination of knowledge assets are required to create that transmission? Okay, that's what we're looking for now. We're not looking for the patent, we're looking for the creative content, the, the secret sauce, because you can duplicate that anywhere now. But the secret sauce, not the individual persons. But at the same token, you have to make sure that, that individual is getting paid adequately. So that's why we have this, this, this residual. You're getting paid. So when you put the content on the database and your content is being scraped for somebody else's usage, you get a micropayment. So your incentive now is to share the data because you're going to be getting residual income. And by the time you're, you're our age, you should be doing pretty well. I mean, that's the way it's designed to work by engineers for engineers. Not by Wall Street for Wall Street. This, we're gonna we're trying to build this for us and to assure those conditional situations. So, Any more questions. Well, thank I think you I, have a, I have a couple of questions uh, just to make a schedule set myself. Uh, so, in terms of, of using blockchain for some of the existing environments that uh, we're faced with today. Uh, I'll, I'll just pick on a couple. One, uh, Nathan's has a professional simulation engineer certification process. So it's my understanding that blockchain could be used in support of that, you know, capturing the knowledge that's uh, needed to achieve a certain level, for example, and then an individual reaches that level, etc., as they want to move up the scale. Uh, and in terms of sharing that information, the, the token is really uh, to keep it secure. So there's nothing to do with uh, cryptocurrency whatsoever. So is that one simple application that blockchain might be considered for? Well, absolutely. Um, you actually said it yourself earlier. You said I should lay out some breadcrumbs for the people to find this room. That's what the token is. It's just a breadcrumb. It's a point in time that you can measure. Okay, so what you're talking about, what you would be, NAFEMS would become a validator. So you would make a claim that I took this course at NAFEMS. And now NAFEMS would be the validator who would validate your claim. Now you two are married on a blockchain, immutable forever. It cannot be taken away. Okay, so that's very, very simple. It eliminates a lot of administration, but it's indelible. And nobody can say it didn't happen. So that would be the simplest thing. And you become a, a validator, and you, you receive tokens too. So now you're able to support your operations through your validation. 
And fees are never paid, the fees are never transferred because there's this third party, the banks and the insurance companies, out there buying these tokens to access your data, which they're getting for free now, by the way. Another uh, simple example, I'll say, is uh, think of an airplane. Each airplane has a, has a tail number. So I can imagine uh, a blockchain used for a tail number of an airplane, beginning with its initial design through development, through testing, through certification, uh, linking up worldwide partners in terms of the suppliers and who agrees to do what. So would that not be another simple application of blockchain, mainly um, a digital thread, take it one more level, and then at the, beyond that would be a digital twin. <laughs> Absolutely, and but we want, I want to caution that um, some people try to use blockchain for those little micro events, like the actual building of the airplane. What you want to do is find the right place for the blockchain. You have to use it correctly. So with all the things you mentioned, in my mind, those are points where risk is transferred from one entity to another. So when the architect or the designers give it up to the structure people, you want to be able to establish that, that, that transfer. Or when the owner buys the airplane, then the, you relinquish ownership of that airplane from the manufacturer to the owner, these points of risk transfer, when the insurance company takes this, uh, those are the things you want to have on the blockchain. And that collection of risk transfer is going to tell a story. It's going to tell a story about the airplane. And then from those points, you can find all the records you need to go. So it's more, probably more of a hybrid. But to try to get, because to get a, a, a blockchain on the, on, the, on the shop floor, it, it takes some computer science. It takes scripting. And the world doesn't script very well. And you, people are trying to do it in construction, and they're failing. We think they're, gonna, they're not going to do well. But you've got to find the right point for it. Right, and I meant for it to be at the major decision gates. Absolutely. Rather than for daily uh, maintenance, operations. Maintenance records, uh, collision records, everything. Right. Everything would go on this blockchain. And that's sort of the Carfax theory. Back in the old days when you bought a car, it was only, you know, you drove it off the parking lot, it was worth $5,000 less money because you had no idea where that car was in the last two seconds. Well, Carfax, by getting a few bits of data attached to that car, now the car can retain 80% of its value five years after it's sold because you've got those data that, 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 um, that the odometer is correct or, or there's never been a collision or it wasn't in a flood zone. So that's what that's where the efficiency comes into aircraft. Now you can this aircraft, even though it's the same make and model number, might be worth th different than that aircraft based on that transaction record. So now you give the owner a motivation to maintain their aircraft. Now you give the manufacturer a, motiva a motivation to increase the quality of their aircraft, and everybody gets paid for it. So there's all these upward factors, all these upward drivers, if you just structure it correctly. And don't get sucked into the hype about what it's, it's going to change the world. Remember that guy walking up the stairs, that's not the best solution. Okay, there's, but we can find the best solutions, best applications. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So at this point in our schedule, uh, I encourage everybody to go next door, one way or the other, to the uh, exhibition hall this Saturday, and uh, network, and uh, get ready for the next uh, sprint out. Thank you.